Well, thank you so much for coming this evening. We're, we're so pleased to be here in Krakow, and it's lovely to see so many people here today. Um, my name's John Moss. I work for the Cardano Foundation, and this is Tom Kelly, who also works for the Cardano Foundation. We have got a wonderful speaker for you today, uh, Duncan Coots, the head of engineering at IOHK, and Duncan's going to be on shortly. We also have Dominic um, at the back, who's filming. Give us a wave, Dom. <laughs> so Dom's from IOHK as well. And we also have Mackie, who is at the back there. Mackie's from uh, Cardano Foundation, and she's going to be just writing up some of today. And um, also I'd like to uh, thank Mycheck, who is in the yellow T-shirt here, who's been our sort of organizer on the ground, helping get the venue and bringing you all together. So uh, Mycheck, thank you so much for the time and effort. <laughs> Wonderful. So yesterday, we were actually here. We went out uh, yesterday evening, and it was a beautiful weather, and there were so many people. We were very, very impressed with Krakow. It's a beautiful city that you have here. So it was lovely. We were made very welcome. Okay, so let's just tell you a little bit about a few things. So, what is Cardano? Well, we have to go back nearly 10 years now to when Bitcoin was first started, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Bitcoin, but really what was defined with Bitcoin is a store of value. Um, but it did have some shortcomings which we're trying to sort of solve with, you know, the technology that we have with Cardano. So that was about 10 years ago, store of value. The next up was Ethereum, and Ethereum brought around sort of two new concepts. One was this smart contract. So this was the idea that products and services could be revolutionized with an immutable contract. And the second thing was the ICO, this amazing ability to raise money without any kind of institution or bank. Um, it really kind of supercharged crowdfunding. So now we come to Cardano, and really Cardano is built on the technology and ideas that were, were sort of um, within Bitcoin and Ethereum. However, we look to solve three key areas which we think are big problems that perhaps haven't been solved previously. The first one of those is scalability. So how do you actually have a network which can manage the transaction load that's required for such a big project? The second one is sustainability. How do you have a governance system and decentralization which ensures that the whole project uh, is sustainable and um, can, can run itself and, and be democratic? And finally, there's interoperability. How does Cardano interact with other projects, other cryptocurrencies and other networks in the sort of normal world, so to speak. So some competitive advantages of Cardano versus some other projects. Well, we're the, I think we're the only project that's built with Haskell, which is a high assurance coding language. And that really is around, with smart contracts in particular, you need exact outcomes when you're doing such you know, important transactions. So Haskell, is a, we think, is a suitable um, language. I'm, I'm sure Duncan will touch more about why Haskell was picked and its importance. Next is the projects built on peer-reviewed academic research. We have, this is really for the IHK side of things. We have some of the best minds in the world, mathematicians, cryptographers, and they are really looking to solve some of these deep problems um, which need to be solved to allow such a network to be in existence and, and run efficiently. And finally, we're led by some really great industry leading uh, professionals. So Charles Hoskinson, which I'm sure you all know, is a mathematician. He was the ex-CEO of Ethereum. He was around in the very early days of Bitcoin, so he knows his stuff. And there's some other guys at RHK who, who really were part of the Ethereum project, have been in the space for some time. So some of those perhaps problems and, and stumbling blocks have already been thought about you know, for, for many years now. So there are three key partners in the Cardano project. So the first one is the Cardano Foundation, which is a non-profit organization which takes care of lots of things, which I think John will touch on in a minute. That is the organization that both me and John work for. Next one is Input Output Hong Kong, or IOHK. And they really take care of all of the academic research and all the development work. Um, I think there's there's well over 100 people working in RHK now. That's um, Charles Hoskinson is the CEO, and that's kind of perhaps um, a big core part of the project. And finally, you have Emergo, who are the enterprise uh, alliance uh, team. So what they're looking to do is to bring on 
enterprises, look at use cases and how Cardano can interact with enterprise. So the, the foundation is a, a really key part of the project. We're here for evolving Cardano together. That includes everybody in this room and everybody who's involved in actually using and supporting Cardano for the future. So, and the future is a really key word for us. This isn't something that we see um, that's you know, short term. This is something long term, almost a gift to the world that can be used. And as Tom said, we're based in Switzerland, uh, in the canton of Zug, or affectionately known as Crypto Valley. And we're focused on five key specific things. So the foundation is there for ensuring stakeholder accountability. So that's things like the FP complete audit, which we've looked at. Um, so that's looking at the code that's used and, and making sure that we, we do the right thing there and working alongside IOHK for that. Shaping legislation and commercial standards, which is important. So making sure that we're, we're, we're telling people about the benefits and also working with the right organizations. Driving adoption awareness of Cardano is really important and education is going to play a really big part of that because it's young people um, and, you know, who need to know about this for the future as well as, um, you know, people of all ages. And then also growing the global Cardano community and meetups are a really important part of this. So we have around 29 different meetups now um, operating in the, around the world. So that's over 5,550 members and in over 19 countries. And that's growing almost on a weekly basis. And we think meetups are a wonderful way for us to be able to meet the community, which is all of you guys, and, and listen and get feedback and also tell people about the project. So once again, thank you very much for giving up your time this evening. And last but not least, about facilitating partnerships. So being able to work with organizations. And you know, if people want to know more about the project, you know, we're here to help. So the starting point, if you want to learn more about the project, is really this website, kadano.org. So from here, there are all the resources that we have. So things like academic papers, there's roadmaps, there's documentation, there's the history of the project. So really, if you really want to learn more, that's the best place to go. We've also got our very active community channels down here. So these have grown quite considerably in the past, well, months. When I joined, they were all on zero, so <laughs> which was um, May last year. Um, so yeah, we have a, a thriving community online. And as, as John said, meetups are a big part of that as well. One of the other channels that we have and, and something that we're finding to be a real value to people who are contributing is our forum. And the forum can be found at forum.cardano.org. So we have about just over eight, eight and a little bit thousand people who are registered. But it's a, as you can see, it's very clear, it's easy to use, registration takes a couple of minutes, and we're seeing a really good level of conversation on the forum. So we see it sort of the deep level conversation. So it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of value there. We have a lot of very engaged community members who are incredibly knowledgeable. And so we're finding that's a really good place to be. Just as a little aside, how many people are on the forum and have registered? Two, three? Three. Oh my goodness. How many people are going to register this evening when they get home? Yay. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. So just to summarize, um, Cardano is a third generation blockchain. Um, the project has three key partners, Cardano Foundation, IOHK, and Emergo. If you want to learn more about the project, go to cardano.org. And when you get home, all sign up to the forum. And before we introduce the speaker for this evening, you've got a couple of quick, yeah, there's quick questions. We tried something. This is the first time we tried Facebook ads to advertise the meetup. So show of hands who found out about this meetup from a Facebook ad. <laughs> oh. One. OK, so that wasn't so successful. What about people who are members of Krakow Crypto and got an email from them? Ah, now wow. that's the one that works. OK. So we now know. Okay, that's very useful for me. <laughs> Thank no, you. No more dollars to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I think.
think it's on the way down anyway, so. <laughs> okay, cool, we're done. It's uh, very nice to be here. Um, it's very nice to have such a large audience. Um, so my name is, is Duncan, and uh, as they were saying, um, I, um, I'm in charge of the engineering for Cardano. Uh, I'm the head of uh, engineering for Cardano for IOHK. Um, and I'm a computer scientist and a programmer, and I am not a marketing droid. Um, so I, I deal with, you know, uh, yeah, I think of myself as a computer scientist. Um, uh, I also have been, uh, I, I started a Haskell company many years ago. Uh, I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, so I have, a, I have a PhD in computer science and 10 years experience uh, doing Haskell consulting and over 20 years with programming and nearly 20 years with Haskell. So that, that's my background. That's, I'm not saying that to show off, but, but to, so that you know that what I'm talking about is technical things. Um, so what I want to tell you about is how we're building Cardano, and, and then I will talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the new features that we are currently working on. Um, we'll see if I get to all of them. Um, I, have a, I have probably more slides than we can get through, but if you ask questions, I might then jump to some of the other topics. Um, but I, hopefully we'll get through some of, the, um, some of the major ones. But I want to start off by talking about how we're building Cardano um, and, and the, the, the philosophy um, of, of how we're building it. Um, so why should we care about the, the quality of software, uh, particularly when it comes to, to cryptocurrency systems? Um, I mean, in, in many ways, the answer is completely obvious, right? If, if you all believe that a cryptocurrency is a real currency, then it should be important that that system not fail and, and the money is all destroyed, right? And you know from just using software every day that, that software is generally terrible. Um, I, I, I like to say that industry standard is terrible. I mean, pe people sometimes say, oh, this is industry standard, meaning, and they mean it's good. But when I hear that word, I mean, I, I think, uh-uh, no, no, that's really bad. Industry standard is, pfft, is bad. So the question that you should all ask anyone who's trying to push some new cryptocurrency system is, why should I trust you or why should I trust your system with my money? Um, and, and what you should ask them is, Show me the evidence, right? I don't just want like nice slides and good talks and nice speeches and people's reputations. I want evidence, like, like science, like mathematics, right? Hard evidence, not just talking. Um, and maybe that's because I'm very risk averse. I mean, no one should ever take any inv investment advice from me because I'm very risk averse, um, which maybe is probably a good thing for building software, um, but. But yeah, don't, don't ask me about... Uh... So I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, if you like. You know, I, I worry about these systems. I, I would not trust my money with most of the systems out there, I think. I think it, it's, too, it's too immature yet. Uh, and you'll see why I'm, what I'm talking about. So cryptocurrencies are you know, new. They are radical. Uh, there's lots of brilliant new ideas. Um, but um, we shouldn't get above ourselves. Um, oh, and by the way, it's totally okay to ask questions all the way through. So if you have questions at any point, stick your hand up. Did you have a question right now? Oh. Go on, ask your question. Go on. Would you trust your money with Bitcoin systems? Uh, I, I'm not invested in Bitcoin. But I mean, you said that... But I'm not giving any investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you should not take any investment advice from me. It would be a bad I'm idea. Just, I, I would not trust most software systems. I, I, I've seen how the sausage is made. Uh, Bitcoin, and I agree, I agree with that, but what about Bitcoin, which is uh, regarded as the most secure? It, it's had a lot of people looking at it, which is better than most. Um, but it doesn't have the kind of evidence that I would like. And I, I will talk about what, what, what does the evidence look like? What, what should we be aiming for? Bitcoin is better than some, but it's not the standard I would like to see. So. I, yeah, I think there's, there's a slight danger with, 
with, with cryptocurrencies of people believing that everything is new and we only need the new things and we can forget all the old stuff. Everything is, you know, everything is new, everything is glorious. Um, and, and I want to remind you of the, of the story of Icarus, uh, who, you know, his father, this is the, the, Greek, the Greek myth, the Greek legend. Um, they were trying to escape from the, uh, the labyrinth, the, the island with the labyrinth, and uh, Daedalus, uh, the father, you know, made these wings. And, but, but Icarus, the son, uh, he, he thought that the rules did not apply to him anymore, that... Um, that reality, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't get him in the end. And he flew too close to the sun, and he, you know, fell to his death. Um, and, and so this is, you know, he, he, his problem was hubris. Um, and I think there's a danger with cryptocurrencies of, of crypto hubris, um, that we don't acknowledge that there are, you know, many, many other... Um, that, that everything is that everything is new and that we do not need any of the old ideas anymore. Um, and that's not true. Right? It, it's a mistake to believe that you can build a cryptocurrency system by only being an expert in cryptocurrencies. And why is that? It's because the opportunities for failure, to, to crash with your you know, wings falling apart, crash to the floor uh, or to the sea, uh, th there's so many possibilities for failure. Um, I'll just rattle through some of these. Um, it's easy to get your protocol design wrong. This is about the cryptography, like the, the like Ouroboros is, for example, in this category of um, protocol design. It's, it, it's very easy to get that wrong um, if you're not an expert in it. Um, the thing that I worry about all the time is translating a design into an implementation. How do you go from you know, a design, even if it's a good design, how do you go into a correct implementation? There's so many ways to fail at that stage. Um, there's all the ordinary ways that software you know, has mistakes. You, you, you know all the time you're getting updates for your uh, operating systems and your, or your applications or websites or whatever. You know, there's, there's all these typical mistakes. Um, amateur cryptography is a very dangerous thing, which sadly I, I, I suspect too many systems practice. Uh, I, I, I like to say that amateur cryptography is like amateur brain surgery. Uh, it's, it's really not a good idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can fail, a cryptographic, uh, a cryptocurrency um, protocol system can fail by missing performance deadlines. All of these systems have deadlines, like Ethereum has, what is it, 15 second block times. Um, if, if you start to miss those performance deadlines, the system collapses. That, that's a property of most of these current systems. Um, the system can collapse under load, just the ordinary load that you expect. You can, the, a system can fail because it fails to scale up to the size everybody would like it to. Um, Bitcoin is maybe in danger of, of failure to scale, that it may not become as successful as everybody wants because it doesn't scale to the size that everybody wants. So maybe, you know, that, that's, a failure, that's a failure to scale. Uh, these systems can have denial of service attacks. Uh, it's very easy for that to happen uh, unless you're very careful. Um, th there's possibility to fail due to economic attacks. Um, you can have voting or social collapse. Like Bitcoin has no voting system. Um, it has a social process, and maybe that process works, but maybe it doesn't. Or, you know, if you come up with some new system, it, it's possible to fail for that reason, right? Or it's something that you have to think about. It's an opportunity for failure. Um, and you can have economic collapse, like due to the nature of the economy. So there are so many ways that these systems can fail, and you have to think about them all and avoid, avoid all those failures, and that's, that's hard. So you do need all the old knowledge as well as all the new knowledge. You need expertise in loads of things, cryptography, computer science, formal methods, programming languages, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on and on. And no one's an expert in all those things. I am you know, an expert in maybe two of those things. Um, because I did a PhD in, in like, one of them. Um, so, which, which go on. Was, uh, what was uh, the area of your PhD? Uh, mine was in uh, programming language technology. Okay. Yes, my... Mic for, the... Oh, for the questions. Yeah, sorry, I should repeat the questions. Yeah, so I, I, my, my academic background uh, in computer science was the study of the design of programming languages. So, um, I have opinions about, like, the, um, the smart contract languages. Um, based on, you know, this, based on, you know, 
my, my knowledge of the, the research that's been going on for, for years and decades in that area. So the point is there's all these different kinds of uh, expertise that, that you really need to build a successful uh, system. Um, so the Cardano development philosophy is to use the best available academic knowledge and, and skills in, in all of these all of these areas are disciplines of study, bodies of knowledge, decades of research, and people who know about those things. And we should take advantage of that. I mean, it seems obvious, but that, that is what we should do. I mean, of course, that's what we should do. So we want to rely on expertise from you know, all the different areas, mathematics, cryptography, computer science, um, software engineering, economics, other, other areas, other disciplines. Um, we do original research where it's required. Many, many times we can just pick up existing bodies of research, existing bodies of knowledge, but sometimes new and original research is required, like Ouroboros is one of those bits of research. And an, an important part of a development philosophy is we have to pick an appropriate trade-off between doing everything very carefully and slowly and getting features out that everybody wants. So. Um, Something that we have to think about a lot, uh, as, as you know, myself and a few other people who are trying to guide the development of the system, is how do we trade off, um, how do we pick an appropriate trade off um, of delivering quality and delivering features quickly? Um, so let me just do a very brief history of, of where the project is uh, or, or has been for um, in terms of its development. So the, the, the first um, code was committed um, in the summer of, or autumn of 2016. Um, the, the mainnet release was a year later, uh, and I, I came on board to help about halfway in between those two. Um, so I, I wasn't there right at the beginning. Um, and then more recently, we've been doing um, rolling releases, uh, and, and that's the practice we intend to uh, continue. Um, another way of looking at the history is by looking at um, the exchanges that are using Cardano. And it started off with just one, um, and then a second one was added a few months later. Um, there's currently at least a dozen. Um, we have, I mean, I, coin market cap lists about that number that have a significant volume, and we have, like in our tier one support channels, about that number as well. Um, and we're expecting, we're expecting more exchanges to, to integrate our wallet. Um, and we've made some important improvements for exchanges, um, particularly in our wallet. Um, the 1.2 release had a better API. The 1.4 release, which is due out in a, in a, in a few weeks, um, will include a, a completely new wallet, which is really designed for, um, for exchanges. Um, so from, from launching the system and running it for a while, there, there are some lessons. Um, and, and because I'm a, you know, an engineer and a programmer, I tend to focus on the negative things, the things that, that are bad, because those are the things that are in front of me that I have to fix. And I tend to kind of ignore all the stuff that like, works, because the stuff that works doesn't cause you problems. Um, but it's important to acknowledge, you know, I shouldn't just focus on the negative. Um, so it's important to acknowledge the things that, that have worked out well. Um, and you know, one thing that's very good is that the system has been uh, completely stable. It, the core system, I mean, I know there's been lots of problems with the wallet. I will get to the wallet in a minute. Um, but the core system has been completely stable. Um, we've had 24-7 uh, uptime. Um, the, the system is globally distributed in lots of different uh, data centers around the world. Um, and we have had um, data centers go offline or lose connectivity or machines crash. Um, but because it was globally distributed and designed to to be fault tolerant in that way, um, it has survived those events without any problem at all, which is nice. And we can tell that because of our, our, our monitoring system. The, our, our operations people have a good monitoring system. They can see uh, how the system is performing at all the times. Um, there's just a random statistic that 95% of the transactions end up in the next block. Um, so that, and our block times are 20 seconds. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, and exchanges are able to get high enough throughput by using multi-output transactions, which is, of course, the same as in Bitcoin. Um, so, but, you know, that's, that's good. The exchanges are not having major problems, at least not anymore. So all the negative things. Um, 
there's, there's obvious lessons that we had from, from launching the system. Um, the, the system was built you know, and launched in just one year, um, which from my point of view is very quick. Uh, I know it wasn't quick enough for everybody. Everyone wanted it to be done now, now, now. Um, but doing it in one year um, is actually quite fast for a software development project. Um, and in many ways, doing things that fast um, you know, does not achieve the, the quality that, that, that we ultimately want. Um, so we, we certainly know that uh, the performance requirements needed to be better understood at the beginning. Performance engineering has to be done earlier. You can't do performance at the end. Um, and distributed concurrency and networking are hard. Um, I, I, mean, I say that as a computer scientist, that they are, they are difficult topics, they're difficult problems. And a corollary, a, corollary, uh, uh, a consequence um, uh, or a lesson about um, hard problems is that you need to take more formal approaches. Uh, this, this, is, you know, this is the way that computer scientists think about these things. If you've got a hard problem, you can't tackle it using informal or ad hoc methods. You have to, you have to use more mathematics. You have to use more computer science. Um, and that, so that's an obvious lesson. Um, so, which, which of course fits with our, the philosophy, our development philosophy that we're trying to aim for. Um, so let me give an example uh, of um, an area where we've had problems um, and how we have tried to address those problems. So the, the wallet backend, the, the, the wallet that you see uh, when you interact with it is a, is a JavaScript um, web technology application. But the backend is, is a separate component. So there's a, a front end and a back end to the, to the Daedalus wallet. Um, and the wallet back end um, is, when we launched it, it, it was good enough for desktop users, but it was not good enough for exchanges. Um, the exchanges had lots of problems with it. Um, it, was, it was not written uh, with the exchanges in mind sufficiently, uh, and the exchanges had lots of problems, particularly with, with performance um, of, the, of the wallet backend. Um, and we have been, uh, we started a project at the beginning of this year to, to rewrite the wallet backend completely from scratch. We decided that that was the best way to to, to deal with it. And we've done that using a much more formal computer science-based um, approach. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into details about what I mean by that. Um, and so we now have a, um, a large um, formal specification uh, for, for the wallet. Yes, question here. So the question is, when, when do we expect the version for Linux? Um, there's a beta out already for the Linux. The, the problem, uh, the reason that we've not released it for um, beyond the beta yet um, is because the, there was a problem to do with um, how many inodes the, the, the block database was taking um, because the block database was using a, a hastily written uh, approach uh, which was taking far too many, using far too many files. Um, that is being, um, that's being rewritten as part of the 1.4 release. So we expect that we will go out of beta for the Linux wallet uh, with the 1.4 release. I mean, you can use it now, the, the one that was on the, the forums uh, that, we, that we posted, the beta, but um, if you have a small drive partition, uh, you run into problems. It, run, it, it fills up the, um, runs out of inodes. So that, that's being rewritten, that part, that problem is being rewritten, and that will come out with the 1.4 release. So with the, with the wallet backend, yes, we now have this, um, this, this formal specification. And I'll tell you what I mean by, by that. Um, so this is about how do we build, how do we want to build software? And how are, are we building you know, new components like, like the new wallet backend? We, we want to write down, we have written down, a precise specification of what it means, what a wallet is. What, what should a wallet do? What, what questions do you want to get from the wallet? And what should those answers be? Like, you, you, you need to know, what is my balance? Well, what, is, what, is, what precisely is the meaning of my balance at, at any one time? Um, it, it turns out it's a question, it's, a, it's quite a subtle question. Um, but you need to give precise answers. Um, I mean, the software is going to do something, but you want to know 
that it's the right thing. And so the question is, what is the right thing? Can you write that down? Can you write that down precisely using mathematics? And, and the answer is yes, but it, it requires effort, and you have to do that. Um, it turns out there's three different kinds of balances. Um, like there's at least an available balance and a current balance, and I don't need to go into details. Um, and the idea is that software is actually programs, computer programs are actually mathematical objects. And they can be reasoned about using mathematics. You know that you know, in mathematics you can prove things, you know, formally prove things so that there's no doubt whatsoever. Software is also a mathematical object. You, you may not see that when you're writing Python or, or JavaScript because those, have got, those are not really designed to have a good mathematical uh, basis or explanation. But in principle, software is a mathematical object, and you can reason about it formally. And so you can, you, the trick is that you, computer science uses mathematics to specify what software should do and to say when software is correct. Um, so that, that's the, the general idea of, of writing down a specification, that you use mathematics to describe what the software should do. And that lets you be completely precise. And it forces you to improve your design, because in, instead of just writing code, uh, you, you have to, if you have to write down a precise design using, using mathematics, it, it forces you to think more clearly and to make your design as simple as possible. And, and that's really important for the, the quality of a design. You, you get much better designs when you make them as simple as possible. Um, the, it, it's, it's like night and day, the difference between um, a a design that has lots of accidental complexity and a design that is as simple as it can be. Um, it's much easier to be confident that, that what you are specifying is right if what you're specifying is simple. I mean, it, 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 it seems obvious when I say it like that, maybe, um, but, but people don't do that typically. That is not industry standard, right? Um, so in principle, I said you can prove things um, about software. You can use mathematics to prove things. Now, that's, we, we don't actually do that, uh, at least not for, uh, we, because we, we need to make this trade-off between delivering software quickly and delivering the highest possible quality. And so the, the, the trade-off, the point that we pick, is to say that we use the mathematics to specify, but we don't then prove that our implementation does what we say. Instead, we simply test it. Now, testing is not as good as proof, but it's a lot quicker, a lot quicker. And if you've already done the, the hard work of, of specifying, making your design as simple as possible using mathematics, you already gain a huge amount in terms of design quality. Um, that that, that trade-off is probably about right. Um, so that, that's what we do. We, we specify it with mathematics, and then we use testing techniques to, to check that our implementation does what our specification says. Um, so let me, uh, uh, yeah, and, and the, overall, the overall effect is that this leads to dramatically better code, um, dramatically fewer bugs, easier to understand, um, easier to understand the performance uh, as well as the, um, the correctness. Um, let me just show you, um, now this is a little bit too small, so I'm not expecting you to be able to read this and understand it because it requires a few pages more of, of definitions to get to this stage. But the, the key point here is that this fits on one page, and this is now the, the basic specification of any uh, UTXO-based cryptocurrency wallet. And that the key point is it fits on one page, and that is how simple it is. Whereas, you know, if we were trying to specify the previous design, it would have never fit on one page. It was far too complicated. This is so simple that it fits on one page. And that, that is actually quite an important achievement to, to achieve that level of reduction in complexity. It eliminates huge opportunities for bugs by reducing complexity. Um, and it's, uh, so th this, this is part of uh, the, the, the specification that we've published. Um, it's online. Uh, anyone who knows you know, a bit of mathematics and set theory would be able to read this specification and have a good, you know, and understand it. It's not actually all that complicated. It does not rely on any advanced mathematics. It's just simple, yeah, logic and set theory. 
Um, all right, here's a, a, a commuting diagram. Um, this is about how do we test our software against a, a specification. It's all very well to have a specification, but how do you then, how does that help you to test it? Um, and, and the answer is there are, there are testing techniques, and I will describe what I mean, that, that are actually extremely good for testing a, an implementation against a specification like this. Um, and it, it, it produces evidence. Right? And remember at the beginning I said, show me the evidence. Right? I want to see evidence. Well, this is, this is a technique that produces evidence, right? You don't need to believe me anymore. You can go and look at the, the tests. You can see that they run. You can see that they work. And, and or it, maybe not everyone will understand it, but enough other computer scientists could understand it and look at it and say, yes, that is actually good evidence. It's not, it's not the highest standard of evidence. It's not a mathematical proof, but it's pretty good evidence. Um, so how does this work? Um, so the, the key idea is that the specification that I said we have here, that's just mathematics on a piece of paper, um, we have to, we turn that into an executable specification. So this, this mathematics is just mathematics, but it was written in such a way that it's constructive mathematics, it's, it's computable mathematics. It's, it's straightforward to translate this specification into equivalent Haskell code. And that Haskell code can be run. That, that Haskell code is not necessarily efficient. And it's also ignoring important, many details. It, it's, this is an abstract specification. Abstraction means ignoring the details that are not important and just focusing on the details that really are important. So in this case, this specification ignores details to do with cryptography and signing. And it focuses on what is the meaning of your balance? And how does that change as blocks arrive and you make transactions? Um, that's the, the key thing that it is, it is focusing on um, in, a, in a UTXO setting. Um, so this can be translated one for one into, into Haskell. And that's a good case where Haskell is a real benefit because Haskell is a mathematical style of language. So it's easy to translate a mathematical specification into a mathematical style programming language. And then that gives us you know, an executable or a com computable version of the specification. So that gives us like a, an abstract model of the, of the wallet. And then, so that's what this is up here. This, this arrow is representing a function which is changes in state of the wallet at the level of the abstract specification. So that might be a, a function like uh, apply block apply block takes the state of the wallet and gives you the updated state of the wallet after having applied the block. So it's, it's a state transition, so it, which is a function. So this thing is a, yeah, a function uh, on, on states of the wallet of the abstract wallet. And then at the bottom, we have the real implementation, um, which is also represented here as an arrow. And that is, you know, as the, as the real wallet changes state due to you know, a real block arriving from the network uh, and being updated in, in the wallet state. And these things should be somehow equivalent, right? The whole point is that this implementation should be an implementation of the specification, but the specification is abstract. It, it, it ignores details that the real implementation has to deal with. The real implementation, of course, has to do all the cryptography, but the abstract specification doesn't talk about the cryptography. So what we have is an abstraction function that goes from the state of the real implementation and strips out the, deta the, the unimportant details. It, it abstracts away, it forgets, ignores the bits that don't matter to give you an equivalent uh, value of the wallet state in the abstract version. And then those two should then be equal. So the idea is to, to check that the real implementation is an implementation of the specification, we generate uh, large numbers of sequences of operations on the wallet, like a block arriving, another block arriving, making a new transaction, a block arriving, these, these kinds of things. And we apply those operations to the real implementation, we apply those operations to the executable specification, and they should agree at every step. And if they and agree via the abstraction function. And if they agree, 
that shows that their states are equivalent. And if their states are equivalent for all possible uh, sequences of operations, then they are truly equivalent. Now, if you were to prove this, you would need to prove that this, was, that this property was true for all possible sequences of changes in state on the wallet. And we don't do that. Instead, we just test with many, many thousands of sequences of uh, state changes on the wallet. And so that's why you know, testing is not as good as proof, but it's pretty good. It explores you know, many, many, many possibilities. Um, and so that produces really good evidence that our implementation does what our specification says. And if you read the specification, you can convince yourself that this is a sensible specification of what a wallet should be, should do. Um, there are many properties that we can check of self-consistency of that specification. So that, that's how mathematics really helps us with uh, improving the quality of, of software components like this. Yes, question down here. So that means that bugs are very, very unlikely, but they are still possible. That's right. So bugs, so the question was, yeah, are, are bugs still possible, but they're un unlikely? And the answer is yes, it's like exactly that. It, it's possible that you could have a bug here that none of the uh, explorations, none of the, the tests that you tried um, it discovered, but that is quite unlikely. Um, this, this technique gets used you know, in, in other areas. This is not unique to us. Uh, and in practice, people find that this produces quite good um, quality assurance. It's quite hard for bugs to get through a process like this. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Did this make any sense at all? I mean, it's, it, this is a bit technical. It, it gets less technical from here on. Yes, question over here. So, so the question was about, um, so this, this is talking about Haskell here, but we also have, um, your, your question was that, that we have a Rust implementation. Well, we have a Rust implementation of primarily the crypto, the cryptography that's used as part of the wallet and, and everything. Um, so our, our Haskell code uh, uses C libraries and Rust libraries for the cryptography. Um, there is um, some... Um, Rust wallet functionality that's been that's been released, um, but that that doesn't use this technique at the moment. Um, so at the moment, it's only the the new Haskell wallet that uses that uses this um, uh, development technique. Yeah. But yeah, the Rust code is mainly the cryptography. Yes, another question here. What language do we use for executable specifications? Haskell. Yes. So. As, as I was saying, this, this mathematical specification translates almost one-to-one -one into Haskell. I mean, if you, if you line them up side by side, they're really almost identical, just different notation. This, this has you know, fanci fancier notation than the Haskell does, but they're, they're the same style of, of, of thing. You know, the, the, the Haskell is, a, mathemat has, is explicable in terms of mathematical functions because it's a, it's a functional programming language. Um, yeah, so I, we, we can't do that kind of you know, rewrite for everything. Um, so we, we, we decided that the wallet was uh, important to, to rewrite from scratch, and we, we followed this, this technique. Um, but we can't do that for everything. We have to deliver new features. We can't, I mean, if, if I had my way, I would say, just you know, wait a couple of years, and uh, you know, I'll just Go and, go and redo this for everything. And, but that, that wouldn't be OK. That wouldn't be acceptable. Um, so we have to balance you know, improving the quality, like using techniques like that, and at the same time uh, delivering new features, like decentralization. Um, so, but we can try and pick a, um, we can try and, and get a bit of both. And, that, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so as part of, we're taking advantage of the fact that while we implement decentralization, which, may, which involves many changes in the core system, we can uh, write new specifications like, like this and then do the same, same kind of testing uh, against these new specifications. So we will, although we can't write it from scratch, we will try to, uh, or we are um, working on more formal specifications for parts of the existing system without necessarily rewriting them. 
So um, I'll move on to talking a little bit about what's new in Cardano. Um, so as, as I'm sure you will know, uh, the first version of Cardano was federated, but not decentralized. Federated meaning that it was run by uh, Cardano Foundation, IOHK, and Demergo, uh, but not yet fully decentralized, which of course is what you want in a, in a proper um, blockchain cryptocurrency. So decentralization in Cardano involves, uh, from, from a development point of view, uh, it involves mechanisms to delegate, um, to, delegate to, to get, delegate your stake to stake pools. Stake pools are called stake pools with the analogy of, of mining pools. I mean, they're technically a little bit different, but that's the, the general idea. Um, and we need incentives for people to operate stake pools, just like there are incentives in Bitcoin to operate um, mining pools. Uh, we, need, we need incentives for people to operate uh, stake pools. And this is different for uh, proof of stake systems. We need incentives for people to delegate to, to stake pools. Uh, and we also need a robust peer-to-peer um, -peer network uh, that is globally distributed. Um, so I will go into a little bit more detail about, about each of these things. Um, so um, delegation and incentives. Um, Ouroboros has always been designed to be decentralized. We, we are currently running it in this federated mode, but the original design was always to be decentralized. Um, but to, do, to, make, to make it decentralized in practice has it actually required um, some new research. Uh, it has required a lot of design uh, and, and research. Um, there's been two new papers written, one on uh, exactly how the uh, delegation system works, and one on how the incentives works. Um, uh, and then we have an engineering design that covers, that covers both of these things. Um, and this, is, this actually proved to be um, quite tricky um, uh, and required many iterations to, to get right. In particular, incentives, um, uh, getting, getting the incentive mechanisms to come out correctly um, is, is very subtle. Um, it requires lots of game theory. And I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get to incentives in a minute. Yeah, I'll talk more about incentives. So let me summarize how delegation uh, is going to work. So just so that you know, in a, in a proof of stake system, I mean, many, I'm sure many of you already know this, but uh, in a proof of stake system, um, everybody who has coins also has stake in the system. And that gives you the right and the obligation to take part in the protocol. And just as in Bitcoin, where you know, if 51% if of the hashing power is honest, then the system works. And similarly, in a proof of stake system, if 51% of the uh, stakeholders, or, or people who control 51% of a stake are honest, uh, and take part in the protocol, then the system will work. So the difficulty with, in a proof of stake system is that if in, in, in a simple proof of stake system, you would need everybody to be online all the time. And that means that's no good if you're running it on your phone or you know, your laptop, which is off the Wi-Fi. You know, that, that's no good. And then if people are offline, then uh, attackers, it's easier for them to, to attack the system because not enough honest people are taking part. So the key idea in Ouroboros is that there is a, a mechanism of delegation so that I can say, well, all right, my, my, my desktop is not on 24-7. I'm not running my you know, desktop in a, in a data center somewhere. Um, I will instead delegate my stake to someone else who is prepared to be online all the time and take part in the protocol. So you can delegate your, your right uh, and your obligation to, to take part in the protocol to someone else. So how is it going to work in, uh, in what's the design? Um, the design is, is this. Addresses, so remember that Cardano is, like Bitcoin, a UTXO-based uh, currency. So we have, we have addresses. So addresses are associated with stake keys and the stake keys get registered on the chain, on the blockchain. Uh, stake keys have an associated rewards account, and that's for getting your, your staking rewards. Um, stake keys then delegate to a stake pool, uh, and you can change your mind about which stake pool you want to delegate to. And it's the stake pools themselves, it's then the, the stake pools that, that actually take part in the proof of stake protocol. They are then the ones that actually produce blocks um, but you can still do self-staking. It just means that you use a private stake pool. So if you want to run, if you want to do staking from your, from your home desktop uh, with your you know, ADSL line, that's okay. 
uh, and you just register a, a private stake pool. And then you delegate to your private stake pool. Um, so then at the end of each epoch, sta uh, staking rewards are paid out um, into these reward accounts that are, that are associated with each stake key uh, that you registered on the chain. And these stake rewards are paid out automatically at the end of each epoch. You don't have to um, do anything. You don't have to trust the stake pool operator. They don't go first to the stake pool operator and then to you. They go straight to you. They go into your stake um, reward account. And you, so stake rewards go both to the pool operators because they are the ones that are, that are paying for the, the servers and are operating them and uh, putting their, their time and effort into it. And it also goes to stake pool members, people who delegate to stake pools. Um, so that's, that's a, a summary of the, of the mechanism. Um, is there any questions on that? Because I'll move on to incentives. I, I probably should have made a diagram, shouldn't I? Yeah. It, it is so. It, is it is it like a voting system? It is a little bit like a voting system in that in that there's delegation. You you don't have to do it. You you can do it yourself if you want to, but you can alternatively delegate your stake to someone else. And remember, delegating stake is not the same thing as giving them your coins. You know, you you, you keep your coins, but you delegate your your right and your obligation to take part in the protocol to somebody else. Um, so it is it is a little bit like um, representative democracy, a bit. Yeah. Question here? You are saying about obligation to participate? Yes. Is it mandatory to delegate the coin or you can not participate and still delegate the coin? In principle, you can uh, not delegate and uh, not take part yourself. But uh, that means you don't get the staking rewards. There's, there's no rewards in that case. Um, so you're leaving money on the table. Um, and that is against your own interest, not just because of the money, but also it reduces the amount of honest participation in the system. So it's, it's anti-social to do that, uh, as well as you know, bad for your uh, bank balance. Um, sorry, say again? So the system, the system does not, ooh, lights. Uh, the system does not re rely on everybody taking part but enough people have to take part. And so to make sure that enough people do take part, we have incentives. So the, the incentive design, I, I'm not going to go into the full detail of the incentive design. Uh, Lars has a whole hour-long talk about it. Um, but I'll just summarize what the goals are. And it, it's worth understanding that it's, it, it's, it's very subtle um, to get this stuff right. It's very easy to get this wrong. You really need expertise. In, in game theory or mechanism design, which I don't have. Um, so we, we went to um, people who are experts uh, in, in game theory uh, who can prove that you know, the design we have achieves a Nash equilibrium uh, and also they know about you know, some of the practical uh, issues involved in incentive mechanisms. Um, so um, the design goals are, of course, to make sure that people, some people will operate stake pools, set up and run stake pools. Um, and we have to have people delegate to those stake pools. Because for the system to work, remember, proof of stake requires everybody to take part, either directly or indirectly. So we need people to run stake pools and to, um, if they don't want to run a stake pool themselves, to delegate to somebody else's stake pool. So we have to have incentives for both of those things. Otherwise, everyone will do what you were suggesting and just sit there, and then the system will collapse. Um, there needs to be a reasonable number of stake pools. I mean, what is reasonable is open for debate, but it's clear that there can't be too many or too few. What do I mean by too few? Too few is the obvious one. If you look at um, Bitcoin, um, it has you know, five major mining pools which control you know, a vast amount of hashing power in the system. So that number, five, is, is quite small. Um, and many people argue that that is too centralized. Um, everybody knows that if one mining pool got to you know, 40, 50 
percent of hashing power that the system would be destroyed. Um, if one, if one uh, player controls 51% of the hashing power, and they can... Con to go the yes, yes, okay. yes, they could, they could. And destroy himself as well. Yep. But you would like to rely, you would like to rely on more than just, you know, one player uh, always deciding to be honest. I mean, the whole point of a decentralized system is that you rely on, you know, the wisdom of many people, not just, you know, that if one person can be bribed. Um, I mean, yes, there are incentives and there, there are reasons it doesn't happen. But still, you know, many people think that, that five is too few. It's, it's too centralized. It's, power in the hands of too many, too few people. Um, I mean, it, perhaps it's most obvious with some of the um, debates about changes to the protocol. You know, the people who really have a say in, in the changes to the protocol are exchanges and the mining pools. Uh, and there's not very many of them. So, and if you look at other systems, many of those other systems also have actually quite a small number of major players. So we would like to be able to control um, we would like to make sure there's not too few. Um, it, it, also, it also matters to have not too many, uh, and that's to do with um, scalability constraints. Um, so what is the, the attribution model? How many major players are there in Cardano? Uh, well, right now, there's only three, right? Because it's federated. But when it becomes okay. decentralized, uh, we would like there to be many. Now, we, so the-, the how, What's the idea how to maintain? You know, it's because it's not a problem because every system is always decentralized, the, yes, so the, dan the danger is centralization collapse. Now, if your incentive system is set up wrong, then you can have an incentive for all of the mining pools or stake pools but to merge. All the, let's say, owners of the mining pools, they have the real, uh, let's say, real world economic incentives. So your yeah. incentives have to be stronger than their real world you, economic you, incentives. You have to set up the design of the incentives of the system so that people acting in their own self-interest will achieve the outcomes that are good for the entire system. That's, that's the goal of the incentive design. Yes, yes, of um, course, but how, how, do you have any shortcuts on how you would like to manage it? Yes, so we have, we have an academic paper that describes exactly how the system will work, and there are proofs in that paper that the design achieves uh, the equilibriums that we want, and that the kind of uh, centralization collapse dangers or other kinds of dangers are uh, not equilibriums that the system will not um, uh, go to those points. So, for example, um, if you had a situation, it would be an unstable situation to have uh, one very, very large stake pool. The, the, the design of the, of the incentive system would mean that people who are delegating to that one large stake pool, it will be in their interest to delegate to a different stake pool and thereby reduce the size of that biggest pool. That's, that's an, an intuition about how the system works. So yeah, there is this research paper. It does prove that, um, that the incentive system achieves sensible looking outcomes. There's actually a parameter that we, can, that we can choose which determines the equilibrium number of stake pools. And we will probably set it at about 100 to start off with. Um, we, we may have to change that, but, um, but we can control that. And we have, simulate, we have proofs that show that it converges to that number and simulations that show the same. Um, and that the basic idea is that there is competition between stake pools for people to delegate to those stake pools. And individuals can change their mind and move to different stake pools. And through that process, uh, we can achieve good, good outcomes. Question right here? So uh, like with uh, <coughs> almost any system that is um, uh, easy Like in a normal economy, it is very easy to scale financial services. Therefore, um, slowly our uh, banks uh, grow, banks merge, and then you've got the problem of too big to fail. And yep. then the state has to intervene to break the banks up, and then the gravity again towards banks becoming bigger and merging, etc. Uh, how is it tackled? Uh, so so the that richer, rich don't get richer, and then one day there is only one. This, this, this doesn't prevent the rich getting richer, but it prevents stake pools from getting too large. So the, the way that that works is that the, the way that the, um, the rewards are divided between stake pools is not linear in the size of the stake pool. So typically, 
a larger stake pool that has more of the stake in the system will get more rewards, but only up to a point. Once they get to a certain size, they don't get more rewards for being bigger. And so that means that effectively the, the reward like, you know, per person starts to decrease as that stake pool gets bigger. So if you are delegating to that big stake pool, you will actually get a better return by joining a different stake pool. And so you will choose to do that, and the, and the size of the pool will drop. So it relies on individuals making you know, rational, um, self-interested choices. Um, and that will limit the size of, of big of stake pools. And the question here. Ah, oh, voting, voting. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Because if I have 50% in the, let's say, so, one of the biggest mining pools. Well, let me tell you about voting. So um, we have not yet finished the research on the voting. So, but it's so well, let me, problem. right, 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 absolutely they are. So we are not going to immediately decentralize the voting. The voting will remain federated until we have finished the research on the governance system and the, and the treasury model and once we, are, once we have you know, an academic peer-reviewed paper about voting and governance, then we will decentralize the voting. Because exactly the problems that you point out, it, you know, we are aware of that kind of problem, and we're not going to take that risk until we have good research, like we have for this, about voting. So the voting, decentralized voting will come later, uh, once, once the research is done. Um, how are we doing for time? I've got a whole bunch of like, other different topics, uh, but probably we don't want to do uh, every single one. Um, what are we, how are we doing for time? <laughs> one, one vote for more slides, that's not very many. <laughs> so I, I can tell you about networking. Networking is very interesting. Uh, I could tell you about smart contracts. I can tell you about multi-currency ledgers, like native assets that are similar to ERC-20. Uh, or I can tell you about hardware wallets or uh, economic attacks and fees and deposits, like, like bottle banks, uh, which I think is actually really interesting. Um, or, um, oh, or the next uh, Ouroboros Genesis implementation. Um, who, wants, who wants a topic? Network layer, Network layer. all right. Networks are really interesting, uh, and peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, particularly. Um, everybody thinks that peer-to-peer that -peer networks are really easy because there are peer-to-peer -peer networks, you know, the file sharing networks and, and other kinds of, of, of systems like this. And so people just assume, and Bitcoin has a peer-to-peer -peer network, and so everyone just assumes that, that actually they're easy. Um, but it turns out they're really not easy at all, um, not, particularly not in the context of a cryptocurrency. Um, I mean, one of the major problems is that, um, you know, home users... Um, are behind firewalls and, and NAT boxes, network address translation. And that makes the internet not nearly as peer-to-peer -peer as, you, as you thought it was. You, know, you, you think of the internet as being anyone can send information to anyone else, but that's not true. It's really, the internet is really kind of a client-server uh, model. Um, so it's actually quite hard to get peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networking working on the real internet. And the systems that do it have to do a lot of um, difficult tricks. And it means, usually it means giving up on TCP, or it means that you have to go and configure your firewall to allow certain ports through. And that's not really acceptable for a, a mass market product. Uh, I mean, people who run a Bitcoin node, uh, you know, they are maybe a bit more technological, and they know how to configure their, their router um, to you know, open, a, open a port. Um, but that's not what you want for a mass market um, product. And it's particularly hard for uh, cryptocurrency um, because everybody's out to get you in a, in a cryptocurrency, or at least that's the way you have to think about it. You know, if you've got this brilliant proof that you know, the, the hashing and the, or, the, or the proof of stake works, but someone can attack the network layer, um, then you know, you've, you've already you've lost. You know, the, the network layer has to be resistant to attack as well. And it turns out that the, the state of research in secure P2P, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networking is, is very sketchy. Um, I'm not aware of any academic papers that, sh that say, here is a design and here is good evidence that it works, um, given, given the constraints of a cryptocurrency, like everybody's anonymous and everybody's out to get you. Um, 
th there is academic research uh, showing things don't work. Um, there, there's uh, papers that have been published about attacks on Kademlia and Ethereum and, and others. Uh, Kademlia is, is the peer-to-peer -peer, um, discovery layer that, that Ethereum uses. Um, and, and we actually use a variant of Kademlia as well. Um, that's, that's what we're currently implementing. Um, but we've had to you know, go and read all those papers that say, well, this doesn't work and this doesn't work. And maybe you, you know, try, try making this design change and um, that'll probably work. But there's no, there's no published research that says, if you do this, it will definitely work. Um, this, this part of um, computer science needs more research. Um, um, in a, in a, you know, a, a cryptocurrency system, everybody is anonymous uh, on the network. And that makes defending against attacks very difficult, uh, much harder than in a, uh, a permissioned system. There are lots of peer-to-peer -peer systems uh, that rely on some notion of identity where you can kick out the bad people, but in an anonymous system, you can't kick out the bad people because they just come back again as somebody else. Um, and they can, they can pretend to be many, many people, uh, which makes it hard. Um, so, yeah, what we are currently trying to do is um, we, are, we, are, we are, we're talking with, um, we've, we've had uh, helping us for uh, a long time now, uh, some uh, expert um, networking consultants who have lots of academic background in, in networking. Um, and we've been you know, using the, the best available uh, papers to, to um, give us a design of a peer-to-peer -peer system that, um, that will hopefully be resistant to attack. But this is an area that needs more research. Um, I don't think any existing system has a very good story for this. Um, um, and it's also interesting to note that the internet is not nearly as fast as you might think, at least not in the way that cryptocurrencies tend to use it, or blockchain systems tend to use the internet. Because blockchain systems tend to require sending a whole block from one peer to another peer as quickly as possible. So it's not like video streaming, where you've just got a continuous stream of traffic that just runs smoothly at a, at a low bit rate. You have to suddenly get a big block from here to here, and then from there to there, and there to there, and then propagate it throughout the entire network. And it turns out the internet, and in particular TCP, are really bad at that if you want to have the system be completely globally distributed. So we have uh, some measurements that, that, our, that our networking people uh, have done. And they show uh, if you, so these are, these are real world measurements. These are not, this is not a simulation. We also have, we use these numbers to calibrate our simulation. But these are real world, real measurements. So to send a two megabyte block, which is I think the current size of Bitcoin, right? Two megabyte blocks, I think. Um, from London to somewhere else uh, using TCP IP. Uh, to Paris, it's really quick. Uh, but by the time you're getting to you know, other continents, and these systems are, are supposed to be globally distributed. You know, it, it's, it's for the whole world. It's not just for London, Paris, and, uh, and Krakow. Um, once you start to get to these further locations, the, it starts to take really a very long time. And that's despite the fact that you know, the ping times, or the round trip times from here to Australia, are not five seconds. The round trip times from here to Australia are about a third of a second. But this, the, we get these numbers because of the way that TCP works. Um, uh, it's a combination of TCP and physics, the, the, the time it takes for information to come back and forth, and the way that TCP does not really use the system as well as it could do. Um, and so then our models, which are calibrated using these numbers, tell us that any, any blockchain system that works by sending blocks between peers in a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, can only really get about 1,000 to 10,000 nodes um, while in, in a 10-second in a time slot. So supposing you, have, you want to say, like Ethereum is, I think, is 15 seconds, and Cardano is currently 20, but supposing you wanted to hit 10, then to do that worldwide, uh, you, you could only actually have 1,000, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 nodes uh, taking part in the system. So that, that's a real limit on scalability that, that's a consequence of the way that TCP works. Um, and that is actually quite surprising to many programmers and computer scientists. Um, it's, it's not very well known. So a corollary of this is that you should maybe be a little bit skeptical of um, claimed performance numbers. Wait, wait to see if those numbers really work 
when the system works at scale and globally distributed, because this kind of thing can kill you. Um, all right, I, I, are there questions about that, or I can do another topic? Is there a question? Another topic. What, what do we want? We've got... Uh, what, what? Attacks. Okay. So um, the design, of the, the, the vision for Cardano's uh, smart contract system um, is to have, um, you, you've probably read about the, the idea of uh, side chains and Cardano having a settlement layer and a computation layer. Um, Charles talks about this a lot in his, in his videos. The, the idea is it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, you want to have smart contract functionality like Ethereum has, uh, or only better, um, but you don't want to do that in a monolithic way. Um, Ethereum builds in the smart contract system directly into the system, so that if there was a, if there was a flaw discovered in the design of the EVM, it would take down the whole system. The, the, a flaw in the EVM could destroy Ether as a currency, and it would be quite a good idea to separate that out, so that if you had a, you know, a, a fatal flaw in, you know, in your smart contract system, which are complicated, right? The EVM is a complicated thing. Um, it has a large attack surface if you compare it to, say, Bitcoin. Um, uh, so it, it's not all that unlikely that, that a, a flaw might be found. And you, you don't want to rely on that. So the idea is that you separate them and you say that we will have a simple system, the settlement layer, which hopefully we can achieve very high assurance with, and you can only really achieve high assurance with things that are simple. It's very hard to achieve high assurance things which are... High assurance is hard enough to start with, let alone of things that are very, very complicated. So you have a, a simple settlement layer, and then you put your uh, more complicated smart contract systems on a, on a different blockchain. So the, whole, so the idea here is that you have different blockchain systems, but you can move money between them. Right? So they run independently, but you can move ADA or, or other assets uh, between the layers. And so that allows you to have a simple uh, settlement layer that's, that's hopefully quite secure. And then you have your much more you know, sophisticated, that, but, but this layer does not, have, does not have sophisticated smart contract features. And then you put your sophisticated smart contract features in a different blockchain and you link them together. So that, that's the vision. And this works, uh, this design requires um, this idea called side chains. And this is how the, 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 the chains, the blockchains get linked together. So our current plan is to have three different computation layers using three different um, smart contract systems. Now, so one of them is that you'll have seen already probably on the, the testnet website. Uh, they're already... Um, in a, in a testing uh, situation, uh, is the KEVM and Yele. So these are um, a smart contract system that is uh, very similar to the Ethereum. Uh, I mean, the KEVM is directly um, an implementation of the EVM, although done using more high assurance um, techniques. And Yele is a design that's inspired by the EVM and compatible with the EVM, but um, uh, resolves some of the um, design issues with the EVM and um, has, has some improvements on the EVM. But, but fundamentally, it, it's about letting you run existing um, Solidity or Ethereum or, or EVM uh, smart <coughs> contracts. And then we have a completely uh, new and different smart contract layer, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is Plutus, um, which has actually three languages. There's Plutus Core, which is the sort of the equivalent of the EVM. It's the, it's the execution platform. Um, and we have then two other languages which programmers would use that compile into Plutus Core. Um, so this, this uses technology from um, my academic background. Um, there's, an entire, there's an entire academic discipline which uh, studies how should you design programming languages? What should programming languages be like? And people have been studying this question for 50 years. And it turns out that in 50 years, you discover some useful things. And you should take advantage of that. And that is what we're trying to do with, with Plutus. 
um, we are taking advantage of the rich history and knowledge and skill uh, of, of this area of academic study to say, how should we design a smart contract programming language? Right? That's just a special case of how should you design a programming language? How should you design a programming language that works on the blockchain? What, what needs to be special about that? And how, how should you do that? So that, we are, we're taking that knowledge and using it to, to build this other smart contract system, um, which is you know, not based on, on the EVM at all, you know, not just, just based on the best available academic ideas. And it uses functional programming, like, like Haskell. Um, so, so Plutus is a, a functional language. Um, and we also have a, um, a domain-specific language for financial contracts, uh, which is much simpler, um, which, so that for, for the particular problem of trying to express financial contracts on the blockchain, you can write them much smaller, much shorter, and easier to understand. So we have these two different languages, Plutus, which is a general purpose language, and then the special purpose language, just for financial contracts, where if, if that fits your problem, then it's by far and away the better solution because the programs are so much shorter and simpler and easier to understand. And in fact, even business analysts can write those rather than programmers. And there's far fewer ways of making mistakes um, with, a, with a simple DSL like that. Um, it, it, there's, many, there's many kinds of bugs that, that you might see you know, in, in Ethereum, uh, in, in EVM uh, Solidity programs, which just can't be expressed in a Marlowe in this DSL uh, program because the, the language is so simple uh, and so restrictive that you can't, you can't write down that bug. It's not a thing that you can write down. Uh, you can only write down financial contracts. Um, so that's, that's a very nice way of tackling certain kinds of problems. Um, and this, again, builds on ideas that come from, from this part of academia. Um, so I, I'm actually very excited about, about the Plutus platform. Um, but that's because it, you know, it fits my academic background. Um, but we also have you know, the compatibility with the EVM as well. Yeah, question here. Not yet. Um, at least not in my slides. Um, uh, we, will, we, we will get more stuff out about, out about that as, as we go along. Um, at the moment, we, the thing we were concentrating on first was the design of the core language, because that's the bit that actually runs on the chain. And that has to be as simple and secure as possible. Um, and at the moment, we are in the process of designing the, the higher level languages. Um, but we will, there is some stuff that we, we should be able to get out soon, I think, to give you an idea uh, of how it will look like. Um, but a good approximation is Haskell, actually, uh, as, a, as a language for writing um, uh, contracts. Um, oh, and another interesting thing about this is that we are um, we are thinking about the problem of writing both the on-chain and the off-chain code. So if you look at a, if you look at Ethereum, you know Ethereum has uh, you know programs that run on the chain, but in practice, to to make an application, you need code that runs off-chain as well. And people, you know, tend to do that using JavaScript and web technologies, and they use some library W. P3 or 3P to talk to the Ethereum node. And, but none of that was ever designed up front. That was just how it's kind of evolved. Um, and in retrospect, that's, it's kind of obvious that you need on-chain and off-chain. And you need those to work together. And it would be nice if those weren't completely different languages. You know, so your off-chain code with Ethereum is JavaScript, and your on-chain code is Solidity. And those are different languages. And it's hard to understand how do they inter interlink. And if you wanted to prove something about them, how do you prove something about the interaction between the two? Uh, it becomes very complicated. Uh, and it's not necessarily an easy developer experience either. So for Plutus, we are um, tackling that problem up front and saying, you will write one program, and parts of it will run on the chain, and parts of it will run off the chain as part of a single program. Uh, this is a technique from programming languages called staged programming or multi-level uh, programming languages. And so I, I think that hopefully will give us quite a good solution for writing applications that have both on-chain and off-chain uh, components. Because there's lots of stuff you want to do off-chain. It's cheaper to do stuff off-chain. Um, you, know, you have to pay gas for what you do on-chain. Um, and it's slow. So um, do as much as you can off-chain and do the, just the bits that require the security on-chain. We should probably wrap, wrap up. We're, we're, I, I, I think you know, people uh, want to go for the beer. Do we have any more sort of general questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Question over here. No, no yes, to you. <laughs> At the moment, in our, in our current system, yeah. Oh, sorry, say that again? 95% of how many transactions? Because you can have like hundreds, you can have thousands, or 10,000, so it's, I think it's important to know the... Sure, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the um, I don't know off the top of my head the, uh, the transaction rate. Um, I think at the, at the peak, in like back in December, um, we were getting... Um, how many transactions in a block? It's a block to 20 seconds. I think we were typically getting maybe five transactions in a, in a 20 second block. So it's not that high at the moment, right, the transaction rate. Um, sorry, say again? I think on Ethereum, it was like 15. Right. I mean, Ethereum is a bigger and more mature system, and there's more users on Ethereum. So, but I, so one question is how, ma how much are people using Cardano? And that's you know, an interesting question. But the other is, what do our internal benchmarks say? You know, if we artificially you know, do as many transactions as we can, we can easily have the system run with uh, you know, 50 times more transactions than are happening right now. So we have actually a lot of, a lot of room to grow um, and still achieve um, most, most transactions getting into the next block. Um, so our, our benchmarks, so that 95% was in production, but our benchmarks actually are similar and they are like you know, 50 times higher transaction rates. Um, transaction rates that are similar to what you get on Bitcoin. Um, All right, and one more question. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, you're comparing Kudos, like Haskell, but as we know, there are like plenty of people for, uh, for having uh, difficulties understanding monads, monads, you know, all those contours, and et cetera. Uh, so aren't you afraid that Yeah, so, so the question is, am I, am I worried that um, you know, a functional language is going to be hard for developers to adopt compared to like, a, a more mainstream imperative uh, language? Yes, yes, I mean, that, that, is a, that is definitely a concern. So how do, we, how do we position this? How do we persuade developers? How do we make it easy for developers? Well, I think um, one thing to note is that uh, you don't need to know functors and monads and whatever for, for smart contracts, I think. For the kinds of things you want to do with smart contracts, you only need the simple parts of functional programming. You don't need the, the, the functors um, or, the, or the monads. Um, so I think that will be easier. And we, we have to um, produce good training material. We have to produce good documentation. We have to produce videos. We have to produce, you know, to, to educate people how to use this. It has to be an easy way in. Uh, and we are, we are already thinking about how do we do that. Um, uh, IOHK has already been running uh, Haskell training courses for, for people in different places, um, which is partly to recruit Haskell programmers to IOHK, but it's also partly an experiment in how do we um, train people in functional programming to give us... Um, and we, we, have, um, we work with people who, who do Haskell training professionally. Many of my colleagues do Haskell training professionally, so we know how to do that. Um, but another point is that we think... The, the way that we will position it is to say that the, the Plutus platform will be for um, will be simpler. It'll be easier to the, these contracts can be shorter, and and have we think it will be able to make a convincing argument that there'll be fewer bugs uh, in in Plutus contracts, and that we aim to provide you with tools to give you assurance about your contracts. So the, the, Plutus, the, the, the positioning of the Plutus platform is that it, it'll be our high assurance uh, smart contract platform. And you know, unlike random web applications, people actually care about high assurance for their smart contracts. So I think it, it might not be, I mean, it is true that the mainstream programming languages are like you know, Java and Python. They're not like Solidity, actually. Solidity is a very badly designed language. Um, but yeah, Viper and things like, you know, things like Python are not so bad. But they still don't give you that, that high assurance. And people know that that's a problem. 
you know, everybody knows about the, you know, the DAO hack and, and other sorts of bugs like that. And they want to know, how can I avoid that myself? And the, the, what, what we will be positioning is that um, you know, once we've finished developing the, the tools for analysis and verification, um, our, our goal is to provide tools for programmers to not just, you know, the functional language will be simpler and you know, easier that way, but tools to help you specify what is my smart contract supposed to do and does it do that? Can I, can I demonstrate to someone else? Can I produce evidence that my smart contract does what I believe it should do? Um, to try and avoid you know, the kinds of disasters that we've seen. So it might be a hard sell, but I think if, if there's any place that assurance matters, it's, it's, uh, it's smart contracts. And everybody's seen that. So, um, but it might work out, it might not. And that's, that's why we have two platforms. You know, we've got the, 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 the sort of mainstream language imperative platform, and we've got the, um, the, the high assurance functional um, platform as well. Yes, another question back there. Um, do I use Scala, or do we use Scala at all? Um, the IOHK does use Scala for some things. The, um, the Mantis client, the Ethereum Classic client, is written in Scala. Um, for Cardano, we use only Haskell and not, uh, and not Scala. Um, Scala is a, a perfectly good language, but Haskell is even better. So why would I, uh, why would I use Scala instead? Um, Scala is a very complex language, because Scala combines object-oriented um, subtyping polymorphism with parametric polymorphism into one language, and that, that's a very complicated thing. Whereas Haskell only has the simple, um, only has parametric polymorphism, um, so it's, it's a more focused language, and it doesn't have that kind of complexity. Um, so it's actually better language for us for writing higher assurance code. But Scala is a very practical language because you can run it on the JVM, um, and you can access lots of Java libraries. So you know, Scala is a good language, and it's a functional language. But for, for applications like this, I, my belief is that, is that Haskell is, a, is the better choice. Yeah. Question right here. Yeah, so according to Wikipedia, in 2015, uh, more than 50% of global web was owned by... Do we have a mic? Uh, so according to Wiki Wikipedia, in 2016, more than 50% of global wealth was owned by less than 1% of... Of, of people in the world. So how your design addresses this fact so that those so few doesn't get control over the whole system? Those are, those are slightly two different things. There's, I mean, the, there's the wealth disparity, and then there's the, um, you know, how do you make sure that the system doesn't become dominated by a small number of players? And the, the small number of players thing is about the incentive mechanism. Um, but, but as for wealth disparity, um, our system does not, does not solve that. Um, for that, you need you know, um, macroeconomic research in blockchains, in cryptocurrencies, which I think there's not been enough of. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of existing blockchains, um, you know, they, they followed a Bitcoin model, uh, and people have not done the, the macroeconomic analysis to know if those are good, if those are long-term sustainable. Um, will they fail due to macroeconomic collapse? Uh, and, and income or wealth inequality is an important part of that. So I, I think you know, that's a good question that you should be asking me, everybody. I don't have an answer for that. You know, I'm, I'm just implementing the system that we have at the moment. Um, there is a published you know, um, macroeconomic policy, but I think there needs to be more research in that area. Um, and yeah, uh, inequality is an important question. I, I don't have an answer for that, um, but I agree it's a problem. Um, one more question. Uh, did, you answer, did you ask one before? I did. Anyone, anyone else has not asked a question yet? Do you have any external pull requests? Do we have any external pull requests? So this is something that we're currently not very good at. Um, we, we have not been yet very good at integrating um, external contributors, um, which we are aimed to improve on. I think we have accepted some external pull requests, but not very many. Uh, and that's our fault. Um, I mean, there, there aren't very many, but the reason there are not very many is our fault. Um, the, one, the ones that have been made, I think we've, we've tried to, um, to get them integrated. Um, it's partly because our, our bug tracker, uh, or our issue tracker for, for project planning and stuff is, um, is, is private. Um, and for some things that has to be private, um, but 
you know, for better, con for better interaction with the open source community. It ought to be public. So, but we don't want to split the system into two. It, it, this, this is a tricky problem that we're trying to solve. I mean, how do we, you know, we would like to just use the GitHub issue tracker and, and do it all, all there. Uh, I mean, all of our code, of course, goes through there, but we don't have all our, all our tickets uh, on there. Um, we, yeah, we don't, we don't yet have a solution to that, but we, we acknowledge that it's a problem and we are, we're trying to um, figure out a good way of um, interacting better with the community. So, yeah, I, I don't have a good, good answer yet, um, but we're, we're working on it. We're aware it's a problem. We, w we would like, in the longer term, to, to have um, better interaction with developers uh, outside. Cool. Right. Can we give Duncan a big round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you.